in general like we're getting I would say like deep sounds mm. to me the deep has also the meaning of uh, something that connects to the time scales that are not within the reach of the single human life something which is more like geological or uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. even like ancestral in the scope okay Can sound inspire us to think differently? We'll take you to places you'd probably never go. Remote, unfamiliar, not very appealing places, yet ones that are exciting and reveal much about the future challenges posed to our society. Ones that are rich in sound. Future Landscapes, a podcast on the challenges of humankind as heard in sound. During the previous parts of our sonic expedition to infrastructures and the ecosystems that basically model our world, we listened together to a coal power plant, aquaponic farm, hydroelectric dam, grazing reserve, oil well, geothermal power plant, and CO2 storage. Finally, in the previous episode, Together with musicians Václav Havelka and Pan Thorarensen, field recordist Magnus Bergson, and philosopher of technology Lukáš Likovčan, we visited a lagoon formed by the melting of a glacier. Today, we'll try to hear the mysterious object that seems to have nothing in common with human activity. A symbol of fate which seems to represent the personality of Earth, elusive and unstoppable. But the story is a little different and it doesn't free humans from their position as an active agent. More Than You Can Handle, Episode 8, Fagradalsfjat Volcano, Iceland. Many of the places we've already explored with our special microphones are linked to the human effort to extract, produce, or transform energy which we need for heating, lighting, to drive a car, or manufacture goods. Or, in other words, to exist in a modern civilization. But now we're heading to a place that's truly difficult for people to manage, let alone be able to extract the energy it generates. In less than half a year since Fagradalsfjath first made itself known in March 2021, still only as a rupture in the ground, the valley with the active volcano has become one of Iceland's most popular tourist attractions, thanks to its easy accessibility and location near the country's capital. We arrive at an improvised but packed parking lot, load our equipment into backpacks, and set out on a several kilometer long hike. The crest of the hill from which the crater and lava field are visible is teeming with tourists. Drones and helicopters are circling the sky, offering sightseeing flights around the crater, and the wind here is quite strong. The sonic experience of the site is very surprising to us. While a volcanic eruption, a dramatic and violent event in which the Earth's core is spewed to the surface, is very quiet, the human activity creates a lot of noise. This valley is quite deep, right? So it has to be like so much of it. Yeah, it, at the it, moment. It, it, it should be a lot of uh, hot lava underneath. Underneath. This and there's like stuff. still fresh splashing out. Yes, yes. And, and it, it's, it seems like it's quite fast coming. Like you can see it there on the edge. Yes, yes. And all the chemicals, like the colors changing on the crust on the top. Yeah. To me, the scale of such an eruption is actually exceeding anything that is possible to achieve by human technology at the mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. Maybe not necessarily, maybe they are like explosions that are similar like uh, the normal Icelandic uh, volcano eruption. But uh, nevertheless, I think that uh, it's more about not just the scale that we see, but also the temporality of the whole mm -hmm. thing, the kind of like uh, 
spontaneity and irregularity on it. There's something cosmic in the force that we see in front mm-hmm. of us. They're not of the human origin and that's yeah. it's not something that can be tamed by the human desire. From a distance, we can smell sulfur. The power a volcano possesses is tremendous. Over a few months, the erupted and cooled lava of Fagradalsfjord has reshaped valleys that stretch for several kilometers from the original fissure. A similar process has been shaping Iceland's landscape for millions of years, as it's located right at the top of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This is where two giant tectonic plates meet, and over the course of millions of years, each of them is carrying a piece of Iceland with it. As the plates break apart, the island expands very slowly to the east and to the west. Then, volcanoes erupt. Most of the world's tectonic plate boundaries are located deep below the ocean, which makes Iceland unique. It's home to 200 volcanoes, and since the Middle Ages, a third of all the lava that has covered the Earth's surface has erupted here. Contemporary science is concerned with volcanic eruptions not only because of the threat they pose to human habitations, but also because of the amounts of CO2 released into the atmosphere. Indeed, if global temperatures exceed the infamously debated threshold, the impacts could be absolutely devastating. Speaking about volcanoes, I guess the first thing that, in relation to climate crisis that we can think about is uh, the Volcanoes have always been like great manipulators of uh, the climate of our planet. And that also means that uh, it didn't happen just in the distant past. What is also very important in this context is to understand the relation between volcanic activity and geology as something that brings us back to this idea of what does it mean to be something deep. The deep sound we talk about is also related to the deep time, the geological time, and the discovery of this geological time is actually linked to the discovery of catastrophes in the planetary past and also extinction events. Mm -hmm. And so what we have here is like a model example of how some extinction events perhaps started. There's quite a recent example of such a potential extinction event with global reach here in Iceland. During the several-month-long eruption of the Laki volcano in 1783 in the highlands of southern Iceland, enormous amounts of molten rock were released. During the first 12 days of the eruption, Laki spewed lava with a volume of two Olympic-sized swimming pools every second, and the lava rivers that formed swallowed up farm after farm. The ashes covered the grass, causing sheep, cattle, and horses to starve. This also destroyed crops, and poisoned the soil and water. A famine lasting several years killed a quarter of the island's population. But the disaster was not confined to the island's shores. The huge amounts of gases released by the eruption, including more than 120 million tons of sulfur dioxide, were carried by the wind to mainland Europe. Due to the particles in the air, people in London, Paris, Stockholm, Rome, and other cities had difficulty breathing and the sun's rays could not reach the ground, causing temperatures to drop and crops to fail. The climate was disrupted for several years. Overall, the direct and indirect effects of the Laki eruption are estimated to have killed more than a million people worldwide, and many say it also contributed to the French Revolution. It's also interesting in relation to the uh, energy of the volcano like and the toxic fumes of the volcano that they actually mimic something that we are trying to make by technology and that's uh, different methods of solar geoengineering. Mm-hmm. For example, you intentionally put uh, sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere to cool locally or globally the temperature of the mm-hmm. planet. Mm-hmm. It's mostly working hypothesis that this can be done. It has been tested in a very small scale and it's a kind of it's a kind of proposal to actually how to perhaps help a bit the mitigation efforts and the adaptation efforts like in face of the climate crisis but some people say and i think that's 
partly justified to say that that uh, it can actually be a way how to actually avoid some massive energy transition mm. and to actually keep emitting CO2 because we will always have an alibi that we can artificially change the atmosphere afterwards by putting more like sulfate aerosols similar to actually those emitted by this volcano because if you would think about that in a scale like 10 hundred times larger like the effect would be of cooling down the planet and actually counteracting against the, the global heating and the greenhouse right. effect. When people take something from nature, it's very often regarded as a free gift. And they work tirelessly to extract as much energy as possible at the lowest possible cost. In the case of volcanoes, we have vast and immeasurable amounts of energy at our fingertips. But humanity is not destined to harness it. Paradoxically, if this energy were ever released, it would be absolutely devastating. It may seem as if nature is deliberately wasting it to demonstrate what Mary Douglas described in the preface to Marcel Moss's book, An Essay on the Gift. The whole idea of a free gift is based on a misunderstanding. There should not be any free gifts. What is wrong with the so-called free gift is the donor's intention to be exempt from return gifts coming from the recipient. Refusing requital puts the act of giving outside any mutual ties. Once given, the free gift entails no further claims from the recipient. The public is not deceived by free gift vouchers. For all the ongoing commitment the free gift gesture has created, it might just as well never have happened. A gift that does nothing to enhance solidarity is a contradiction. What the volcano teaches us is that energy is not a resource. Energy is a gift of sorts. And that also means that This kind of framing of the energy brings more poetic understanding of what it uh, contains, how it can be utilized for human and non-human flourishing in under this banner of habitability of our planet. So instead of resource to be extracted, we are confronted with a free gift. Or maybe not always a free gift. Sometimes it's a gift that actually seeks to be repaid in some kind of ritual exchange. The way how we Imagine the economy as based on scarcity is actually a very mistaken attitude because on contrary, energetic economy of the planet is primarily about abundance of energy and Volcano demonstrates that. Nature is first and foremost a luxurious squandering of energy. Only when darkness starts to fall can we better see the hot red lava flows that roll down the volcanic hill and slowly disappear into the valley. This is how the volcano reshapes the landscape every minute for the six months that it's active. The hustle and bustle stops for a few moments before new tourists start arriving for a night tour of the volcano. We understand why they're ignoring the risks associated with volcanic gas and setting off with their headlamps on a night trek. A close encounter with a volcano can be revelatory. In his book On Water and Time, Icelandic writer Andri Snær Magnusson shares the following observations. There is no such thing as a permanent landscape. Nature has no constant. Change is its essence. And if it weren't for weather systems and volcanic activity, or the moon that guides the tides, the earth would be dead. Or at best, a stinking ball of algae. Nature is like the Hindu goddess Kali, who destroys as soon as she gives birth. She makes love as she kills because creation and destruction take place simultaneously. In nature, there's no separation between them. It doesn't matter where we rewind back to in time. Nature is always right, has always been true and right. Creation is change. Everything is in the process of transforming. In nature, the waterfall gradually forms deeper ravines or rapids, and the glacier either retreats or else wipes out entire continents. Tectonic plates push against each other and press mountains high into the heavens as other continents get swallowed and disappear into glowing magma. Such an active landscape as Iceland, it provides so many opportunities to actually see these, you know, inhuman metabolisms to unfold. And that's something that can help also in generating a cultural sensitivity Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for uh, the way how certain limits are imposed on the scale of the economy, 
modalities and qualities of the economy that we have. And that's something that can happen really fast, like an eruption of the volcano, perhaps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Literally as well as metaphorically. Mm -hmm. It can hold the transportation, the aviation in half of Europe, yes. as well as yeah, yeah. holding a certain way of thinking. Yes. When we reach the top of the hill on the way back, it's after dark, but the entire valley of the volcano is illuminated by a very intense red glow. The eeriness of the whole scene is supported by the sounds of the lava boiling in the crater, which carry through the silence. As the volcano was waking up in the spring of 2021, the earth shook for three weeks, causing some 40,000 earthquakes in an area that until then hadn't witnessed an eruption for 800 years. It's apparent that we're facing an entity that exceeds man's ability to transform, to exploit, to tame nature. Historically, people have associated volcanic eruptions with supernatural forces, as sound ecologist Murray Schaefer reminds us. Thunder and lightning are among the most feared forces in nature. The sound is of great intensity and extreme frequency range, well outside the human scale of sound making. The gulf between men and the gods is great, and often it has seemed as if a mighty noise was necessary to bridge it. Such a noise was that of the eruption of Vesuvius in AD 79, when, according to Dion Cassius's account, lithe, frightened people thought the giants were making war against heaven, and fancied they see the shapes and images of giants in the smoke, and heard the sound of their trumpets. This event was one of the sound marks of Roman history. Instead of overlaying it with the layer of meaning made by humans, we can instead extract the meaning out of the raw material of reality that the landscape offers us. There's also a remark in this respect to be made about historical change and how landscape can index historical change. Because what we can learn through observing these different landscapes is uh, understanding how historical change happens more in the way of an accident rather than a master plan. It's more about how the tectonic plates of history collide with each other in uneven angles, creating amalgamations that are not necessarily beautiful, not necessarily well-shaped, but still they are this raw material of reality. As we drive back home at night, after almost 10 hours at the volcano, we're exhausted. The visit was challenging, not only because of the relentless wind, but also because of the volcanic fumes it sometimes blew in our direction making it more difficult to breathe. Experiencing the effects of pollution firsthand makes us realize that the volcano is a significant pollutant. But how does it compare with human activity? Andre Snare Magnuson has the answer. Aren't we humans pipsqueaks compared to Earth's volcanic activity? Unfortunately, that's not so. Earth's volcanoes are estimated to release on average about 200 million tons of CO2 a year while humanity releases 35 billion tons a year. The fire we burn is almost 200 times greater than all the combined volcanic activity on Earth. Yet, we go through our day without actually seeing fire or smoke. We see and perceive volcanoes, their ferociousness and their thundering din, but we don't see that we are Earth's largest volcano. We are the eruption, but we don't see flames when we look in the mirror. Everything is so well-designed, so invisible. Earth's climate has, of course, varied. Yes, giant volcanic eruptions have had an impact on geologic history. But as things stand now, humanity has erupted and eruptions of this magnitude have always, always led, to, led disaster. to disaster. What sound tells us about the nature of capitalism is that it is based on 
a mirage, a dream of discrete, well-categorized uh, objective reality. But sound tells us that this homogenization and archaization of the environment that happens through the process of the capitalist appropriation is uh, not in sync at all with uh, what the external reality actually stands for. So to me, capitalism is unveiled in the process of the critical listening as uh, deprived of fundamental sensibility to the affordances of the soundscapes, landscapes and timescapes, these cycles we are talking about so much. It actually doesn't ask all these strategic questions we should ask, like where to slow down and where to accelerate. It is just uh, very blindly based on accelerating, when in fact there has to be something that is called in ecology an equilibrium. Equilibrium doesn't necessarily mean harmony, but it means some at least temporary state of proportionality between the forces that uh, play out in the given environment. As the expedition comes to a close, on the way back to Reykjavik, we make one last stop to take in the landscape shaped by volcanic activity and to reflect on what our immersion into the hidden sounds of places connected to energy, food production, and access to the landscape has revealed. Many times after putting on the headphones, we were surprised by sounds that were very different from our expectations. Other times, we actually heard sounds that we already knew, but were only amplified. But concentrated listening has allowed us to look at things differently, to become aware of their nature and of processes that take place outside our field of vision, and thus to gradually break free from our initial impressions and dominant narratives. The places that essentially model our world have said much about the nature of modernity, raising questions about artificiality and naturalness, or revealing additional layers of the dominant economic system. Capitalism is only one part of uh, what we have seen. There are also layers that are uh, unaffected by the capitalist logic. In that sense that we have encountered a lot of moments of uh, gift exchange between the social and the planetary that we can even call like instances of some kind of everyday communism in a very basic anthropological sense of the world like Marcel Mauss when he was talking about the gift as uh, actually being the most fundamental economic relation in uh, human societies preceding exchange because when we just uh, measure things by their uh, value in terms of the exchange value of uh, how we call it today the, or the monetary value uh, it, we actually are deprived of the possibility to ask question why this has actually value and to understand why something has value we need to go back to uncovering the logic of uh, what makes that object what makes that landscape what processes and forces are involved in the creation and how it actually exists in it's our autonomy. What really made the biggest impact on me was the contrast between the eruption of the volcano and the melting of the glacier. I was extremely sad to see the latter and in this contrast I've discovered something that as a secular person I don't actually like to admit that much but I have to do that because that was the moment when after a very long time I really felt that there's a personality in nature. Thank you for listening to the Future Landscapes podcast. This episode concludes the series. However, 
you can learn much more about the Sound Expedition into the infrastructures and ecosystems of Iceland and the Czech Republic at futurelandscapes.cz. Here you can read the field notes by Lukáš Likovčan from all eight places, listen to the music album by Václav Havelka, Panther Aronson, and Krzysztof Křiček, also known as Field. Delve into the sound archive created by Sarah Pinheiro and Magnus Bergson, and find inspiration on how to cope with the future challenges of climate change with the help of ritual guides created by eight artists. And, of course, you can also just grab a microphone yourself and go listen to the world. (laughs) 